Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to those who are online as well. All right. So let's pick up from where we started last week, the last class. Last class, we looked at the introduction of the fivefold ministry. We, we saw that the ministry gift is a divine call. It is not a choice that we have. Uh, and usually when God calls us, he, it, it's aligning to our gifts that he places in us. And uh, very importantly, we looked at this uh, Ephesians 4, uh, 11 through 16. We saw why the Lord Jesus has the fivefold ministry. It's not so that you know we can be called pastor or prophet and apostle or to get fame or all of that. But he goes on to say that he says, for the perfecting of the saints, uh, so that the saints can do the work of the ministry, which will build up the body of Christ, right? So we looked at the first chapter. Uh, and before I go ahead to the second chapter, uh, I just wanted to make a mention of this, right? Now, there are two things. One is there is a difference between ministry function and a ministry gift, right? So there's two uh, there are two aspects here. We must understand this. There's a ministry function and a ministry gift. Now, what is a ministry function? Uh, for example, all of us can evangelize. Yes? We don't have to be wait for the tag of being an evangelist. All of us can evangelize. All of us can flow in the prophetic. All of us can, you know, pray for sick people, the working of miracles. All of us can walk in a greater measure of faith. Right? And this is the ministry function, all believers. Right? But then the ministry gift is, is usually assigned. God gives it to that person where they flow more. You know, the anointing is more towards that gift. You got it? Everyone, did you understand? OK, let me give you an example. Uh, who's the greatest evangelist? Who, Mary Graham? Okay, okay. So there's a difference between when when Billy Graham evangelizes and preaches the gospel, and there'll be a difference when we do it. Why? Because he's flowing in the ministry gift. Right now, then you'll also see the prophetic. There will be people who will be prophetic every time. Every you know, they by nature they're very prophetic. But then you have some believers who every once in three months can prophesy, right? So nothing wrong in that. It's only that there's a ministry function and there's a ministry gift. Everyone understood, right? So now when, when you are flowing in the gifts, don't think about, okay, is this a ministry function or is this a ministry gift? It doesn't matter, right? As long as you're, you're serving, you're doing it for what? For the building of the saints, equipping of the church, right? Uh, so always remember this. Let's go to chapter 2. The evangelist and Jesus as our example. Right Now, uh, even as we go ahead, we will, we will set Jesus as our example in all of these three portions, the evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Uh, so first one is the evangelist. Did the Lord Jesus evangelize? Right. We see that he did a lot of traveling, but... He didn't travel more than 100, 150 miles away from his hometown. But he did a lot of traveling, a lot of evangelism, right? So the Greek word for evangel, evangel means to proclaim the good news. Let's read Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16. Familiar verse. Any one of us can read. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Hmm. So what is the primary responsible of an evangelist? The primary responsible is, responsibility is to minister the gospel, to reach out to so, but the mindset now is an evangelist is somebody who, you know, has these big meetings and, you know, through these, you know, only go to different cities, have these meetings. That's not, that's not only the mindset. We need to come out of that. We can be somebody who's doing ministry in this, in our cities, in our towns, villages. We are an evangelist. Right now, 
when you see the Lord Jesus, when he started off his ministry, right, he started off with less people, right? He he chose 12, he was there with them, he went to a few places, he went to Judea, he went to the neighboring cities and towns sharing the gospel. And over time, only after maybe eight, ten months was when the hundreds started coming. After a year, it was thousands, right? So it, it was not all of a sudden, just like Jesus, even our responsibility is to proclaim the gospel. Now, how did the Lord Jesus function as an evangelist? How many of you here are, you know your calling is to be an evangelist? Anyone here? Like full-time evangelist. Right. Okay, nice. All right. Uh, so how did the Lord Jesus function as an evangelist? Uh, the characteristics of his ministry, let's look at it. First one. He was empowered. He was empowered. The Lord Jesus was empowered by the Spirit. Right Now, when the Lord Jesus was... Just picture this, right? The Son of God came down from heaven. Now, he's growing up. There's, a, there's an anointing upon him already. But the Bible says that when he was baptized when he came out the holy spirit came as a dove upon him and he goes on to the desert to the you know to pray 40 days and 40 nights why would he have to do that you know, 40 days 40 40 days of not eating is not easy right now what would have happened if he didn't pray would you know always ask questions the other way around what would have happened say jesus got baptized he went back home had a nice meal, got some rest, woke up the next day. Okay, today I'm starting my ministry. What would have happened? W would, there be a, would there be a difference in his ministry? No. Because he's the son of God. But why did he do this? To set an example for us. Uh, to set an example, of course, he also, as a human being, he also wanted, he wanted us, he wanted to depend on the Holy Spirit. Right, but he was setting an example. And Forty days he fasted and prayed, and he was empowered not only in his spirit. I'm sure his mind, his he would have come out of that forty days so strong. Right, the temptations that were recorded was just three, but it, you know everywhere it says that the Lord Jesus, sorry, the the, the devil left him for a while. So he would come back every now and then tempted him but he overcame all those temptations he was empowered by the spirit and it was only after that 40 days when he came out we could see the miracles that he did now this is a wonderful example for us if we want to do a powerful ministry right if we want to minister to god if we want to reach out to people we want people to uh, be uh, you know their lives to be touched prayer is important we need to be empowered by the holy spirit right i always say this we can do some things on our own ability but it will last only for a while right it'll last example we want to start a church we can start nowadays it's nothing not a big deal right Maybe 15 years from now, oh, you start a church, is very difficult. Now it's not a big deal. Buy one, two speakers, buy one mixer, and you start. <laughs> That's all you have to do, right? All, all equipment, you don't even have to go out. You buy it on Amazon. They'll come and deliver at home. Nothing wrong. Nowadays, you, you start, you have one small hall like this. is church, over. Right? Or you can also get a big space. Everyone are willing to give. It's not a big deal, but we can start something and we can continue also. But if we are not empowered by the Holy Spirit, we will not see. We will not see. But in that also, God is faithful, right? So sometimes we may not have spent time in God's presence and then we are doing ministry. God will still heal people. God will still do miracles. God will still touch people's lives because that's who he is. That's what he does. But the Lord Jesus didn't depend on, you know, if you look at his ministry, 
he didn't depend on those 40 days hey i finished my 40 days of fasting and prayer so so it's okay it will leave me for the next one year no problem i've charged up for one year no what did he do every morning he would wake up go and pray and he set the example to his disciples as well right so when when we are doing ministry we need this dynamis power that was a dynamis dynamo like a like a dynamite we need that power right you know why i can share a couple of instances there was a time when we i was somewhere i was sharing the gospel i was just standing sharing the gospel i was fully excited i was you know nothing just you know this is about you know jesus and how he can save your life all of a sudden one five guys came and stood next to me now where's the dunamis power everything is gone right? everything is gone because you don't know how it is. like how many of you have gone through like first hand persecution like you've seen it in your own eyes yeah i'm sure right? is it is it easy it's definitely not easy because i used to preach you know we need the strength of god we need god but when i saw that day these five guys five six guys right in my face you know and it's scary right? they said what are you doing here they're not smiling and all but they're not saying oh good job uh, <laughs> what is this about no they're right in my face i thought i knew that you know they're going to either beat me up or something's going to happen and it was the initial days i remember saying no this is about jesus and and i was very fearful inside but when i went back home and i prayed and i said god why was that fear there you have not given me a spirit of fear but of power love and sound mind but why was that fear is it because i didn't pray enough is it because i didn't trust you enough or is it because of my i let my natural thought my natural instincts overpower me it's natural to be fearful uh the disciples who were with jesus walked with jesus saw the miracles of jesus they were also fearful so what about us you know so so i went back and asked god and thankfully the lord ministered right he said for this kind of ministry you need the power of god you need the anointing one hour is not enough one hour just praying okay thank you for fridge washing machine all those things it's not going to help out right thank you for uh, all the things you have blessed me with good day nice trees all that was not going to help us he wants us to rest in his presence right rest in his presence when we stay and we abide that's when we are empowered and over time there some kind of boldness came right some kind of boldness and there was situations that came up and i thank god Oh, that God gives us the boldness. I'm not saying that initially itself will be fully bold and strong, but over time it will come. But for that, we must be empowered, right? And the best example is that of the disciples. So fearful, they were hiding. What happened to them? What happened in the book of Acts? The same disciples. They're standing there. Hey, you put me in jail. You do what you want. i will preach the gospel what happened two months one and a half months back they were they were running away that's the difference when you're empowered we can do anything god will empower us our ministry will really be blessed right and that's what jesus did there are a couple of verses let's read luke 418 luke 418 maybe some one of us can open to hebrews 2 was 2 to 4 Hebrews chapter 2 was 2 through 4 Luke 4:18 The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the broken hearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me and then that list to set the captives free to bring liberty to the poor but this, he starts off by saying the spirit of the lord is upon me and he has anointed me i always say this the it is only the anointing that can make a difference only the anointing 
even if we are preaching a five minute sermon if it is anointed by god it will touch people's life it will right and people will remember it how many of you remember a sermon you've preached you've heard 10 years back there will be that one or two sermons because that will be very annoying now i'm not saying others are not anointed <laughs> but i'm just saying it would have like the lord would have really ministered to you right so that way when we are anointed empowered and we reach out when we minister to people they will remember it right there are some things that i remember i remember this guy in, in bible college when i was studying right he was from north india he wouldn't speak in english but he he would come every time i see him in the room he'll be praying i said what are you praying so much here and i would feel so insecure because i felt hey i'm not praying like this fellow because how much he's praying he's going on and he's kneeling he'd be kneeling in the room same the rooms that we have it was something like this right we had those same uh, but he would kneel he would not even be on the court I'd tell this fellow he pray for so long and I, and I, he, he talks in hindi he doesn't even know english i pray and the, i remember the sermon one you know same way that uh, in the mornings you all preach same thing uh, he would come, he came up once and he started preaching 15 minute sermon he, in hindi he's crying and i looked around all of us are crying what? half of them didn't understand what is speaking here but all are crying and till now i remember that sermon he was talking about lazarus Lazarus, rich man and Lazarus. I remember that. It's 12 years now. I still remember. It's a picture in my mind. Right? How? Because of the anointing. Because of what he did. Five or eight minute sermon that was. We still remember it. It was anointed of God. When we spend in time, time in God's presence, it will reflect when in our public ministry. It will reflect. Right? Let's read Hebrews 2, 2, 4. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. Uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 2 from verse 2. For it is the message spoken by the angels was blinding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified it by signs and wonders and various miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Yeah, thank you. So if you look at Jesus and his ministry as the evangelist, what a powerful ministry. One time he had 5,000 people. At one time he had 8,000 people. At one time he had five people. At one time he had children coming to him. Right? So it was not a ministry that was restricted to a certain uh, you know, uh, place or a certain kind of people. He ministered to everyone, right? And his ministry was so empowered that the sad thing is that many of them followed him for the miracles, but you see the miracles that he did, right? Breaking five loaves of bread and two fish, walking on water, Right, powerful miracles, healing the blind, lepers being healed. Uh, it is all because he was empowered. Now we must remember that he was walking in his sonship glory. Right? And the Bible says that the same spirit that was in Jesus is in us. So how much we must you know believe and know that you know God can do these miracles. There are some miracles that I've seen in my own eyes, and I thought, my God, how is this? How is how is God doing this? I remember we were in uh, forget the place. I think it was I think it was Rajasthan. I may have shared this with you. In Rajasthan, you no know, one thing about Rajasthan is if you've been there, the believers are ten times much more faith than us. <laughs> I'll tell you, we know so much from the Bible. They hardly know anything, but the faith they have is too much. So you know, we, I went there and we were doing a conference and did I tell you about the car, how the car was locked? Did I give you that example? No. So this, we finished the conference and um, one, one 
family had one car was there and so he put the the mother and the not the mother the baby was inside and this mother just closed the door to go get her bags and call somebody so they closed the door the key is inside the car is locked and the baby doesn't know anything baby is some 10 month old baby right car is locked glasses are all up everyone are panicking oh what to do let's break the glass and all suddenly one man came some leader from cell group leader he came kya what happened and all that and he said no the car is locked okay open the car no the key is inside okay we'll pray so i'm watching all this okay <laughs> yeah, i'm watching all this i said okay pray oh yeshu masi ke naam mein ye door open karo he opened the door <laughs> and he just he just prayed and he opened the door he said okay take the key take the chair okay chalo back to the conference <laughs> I said to myself, "What are you doing, yeah?" So there are many things that I I saw, many many things that I saw, right? Um, yeah, they were praying. Some they have that fifteen minutes prayer before the service starts. All are screaming, you know, right in North India, They're screaming and shouting and praying, wailing their hearts out. Powerful fifteen minutes of prayer. That first fifteen minutes, there's no power. It's fully dark in the church. fully the pitch dark okay you can't see anything everyone are holding kept the phone down with the torch light which is going up is pitch dark no light no fan nothing then the worship team they have come early morning they practiced okay they are praying god bless the worship time bless the preaching time so i was looking around when will this current come yeah i'm not able to pray because i was worried about the power what if the power doesn't come these guys are praying Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You have blessed the worship time, blessed the sermon time. Let there be more miracles, all that. I'm looking around. Nobody's bothered. Okay, there's no power. Then I asked one person, "Is there power backup? What is that?" He asked. <laughs> I said, "Okay, <laughs> it's fine." Exactly as the worship prayer got over, the power come came. They went on stage. The whole service power was there. then we finished that by afternoon we we were stay we stayed back we had lunch everything yeah, i asked the people how come exactly before the worship time the power comes every sunday it goes at 7 o'clock in the morning it's like the devil doesn't want us to have service so every sunday we pray every sunday 8 if the service starts 8:30 8:28 the power will come back every sunday So we are used to this. Devil will put it off. We will put it on. So, so wow! You see the faith they have, and it's a natural thing. You don't worry, Pastor. Next Sunday you come, same thing will happen. The power will go. We'll pray. Power will come. There were times where that uh, you know those uh, there were some testimonies they shared where you know the the light pole itself has fallen down, right? It's broken. Nobody has power. Only church has power. everyone are looking at the church how come this place has power they've all come in and through that some people have become believers who came to church so you it, the understanding is very different but it's the same holy spirit sometimes we get so you know sophisticated in our ministry you know oh we should know everything from the bible no yeah, all this is important but what god wants us to do is to apply it to be empowered in it right so we uh, when we look at jesus he prayed but then after praying he went and did right he used it he didn't say i'm the son of god and sit in his house he did something about it you and i as god's children we do something about it right next one what was his audience the audience was the poor the lost sheep of israel the sinners but we also look at he was also ministering to the to those who were wealthy um Let's look at Luke chapter four and eighteen. Oh, we already looked at that. Matthew ten five and six. Matthew chapter ten and verse five and six. Matthew chapter ten verses five and six. Yes, go ahead. These twelve Jesus. sent out and commanded them saying do not go into the way of the gentiles and do not enter a city of the samaritans but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of israel yeah 
So he's saying here, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then Luke 19, 10. Luke uh, chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Yeah. So the audience we see that Jesus ministered to those who are poor, those who are lost, those who are sinners. Right. Now, you and I can do this too. We go to the lost, those who are sinners. Now, the thing is, when we look at people who are sinners, you know, this morning, uh, uh, I got a message from a friend of mine, an old friend of mine. Uh, we were childhood friends right, you know, in Sunday school and all of it. Uh, a very close friend of mine passed away this morning. Right? He's probably 31 or 30. No, he'll be about 32, 33 years old. Uh, he passed away this morning. I just got the message. Uh, but the thing is... Um, he, I, I'm guessing he died of a drug overdose because he was a drug addict. And I was just thinking to myself, man, you look at the enemy and look at what he does. He's 33 years old. He's a pastor's son, right? He's a pastor's son. So he, I just got the message saying the the body is in his house. Um, pastor's son, only son, right? Uh, and he was he knows everything from the Bible. Brilliant guy. In Sunday school, no, we used to have something called as uh, Bible boy and gospel girl, meaning whoever says all the Bible verses correctly and whoever knows the most from the Bible, and there'll be like a quiz, right? So out of 200, 300 boys, you get one Bible boy and about 200 girls, you get one. So they both are the, like the best. They've got the, they, they know everything. So he was Bible boy for like two, three years consecutively, right? But what is his end? Died of a drug overdose this morning. We look at how Jesus, when you look at Jesus' ministry, he reached out. It's not like he didn't know, my friend. He knew everything. He's a God. He knew the verses. He knew verses that we don't know. Right. But you see how the enemy comes to steal the word of God. He can do anything. The enemy, if we don't guard our heart, right? We don't guard what we learn. He'll come to steal it. The Lord Jesus, when he ministered to the people, he ministered in power. But there were some people who received, there were some who did not receive. There were some people who believed, some who did not believe. Now think about this. When the Jews, right? Especially the Jews, when Jesus went and said, uh, I am the Messiah, how many of them would have you know, criticized him, any of them, right? Very few, actually, if you look at it, very few believed he's the Messiah. Other people believed he's a prophet or a healer, right? But when the Lord Jesus ministered, he didn't look at their background. He didn't look at, do you really believe me? Do you really, you know, think you can, you will follow me? Will you obey me? No. Will you love me? There were times he's healed people and he's not seen them again before. Remember the leper? Are you willing? If you're willing to heal me, I know you can, Jesus. So what does uh, Jesus say? I'm willing. Heals him. What should I do? What, what's there in return? Go to the temple, show yourself to the priest, offer the sacrifices of Moses, be on your way. Done. So when we minister to people, we minister not waiting for something in return. We just minister with all our heart. Right? There will be people who receive. There will be people who will not receive. Now, that is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to minister. Right? Three, what was his message? The main message was repentance, which is to leave the things of the world and turn to Jesus. Repentance was his main message. Repent. Turn away from God. Turn away from the things of the flesh. Turn away from the things of this world. Right? Um, then his, his message was also forgiveness. Right? Where if you look at the Old Covenant, right? if you look at the Old Testament, uh, we see the offerings, right? Uh, the sin offering, the guilt offering. Now, these two, the, the sin and the guilt offering, were offerings for forgiveness, right? 
the sin, the guilt offering were offerings for forgiveness. So what would they do? Every every two months, the the Jews would go. They would offer the sin offering. Then they would offer a guilt offering. Oh God, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of sin. I'm guilty. My words, what I've said, what I've thought of, what I've spoken. I'm guilty. So the guilt offering is given. So, and then we got the. Then he would preach the kingdom of God, and we see a lot of parables that the Lord Jesus spoke of, right, about the kingdom of God. And he demonstrated faith. He walked in faith. He thought about faith. Uh, if you if you read Matthew chapter five, it's a brilliant, right, teaching session. We see there, all the way from the beginning, right. Um, he goes on to say. He talks about who God is, what God can do through you, and what you can become. Entire teaching, right? So his message was plenty: repentance, forgiveness. He talked about the kingdom of God, and he talked about walking in faith. Next one: what were the methods that he used? This is very important. When we evangelize, when we reach out to people, when we are in ministry, we, there are different methods that we can use. But what is the method that Jesus used? Firstly, we know that he prayed. We know that he spent time in God's presence. He was he received as much as he could and then did ministry. And one of the main methods was signs and wonders. Let's read these two verses: Matthew chapter nine, thirty-five and thirty-six. And one of us can read Acts two twenty two. Matthew nine thirty five to thirty six. Jesus went through all the town and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Right. When Acts, he yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because. They were harassed and helpless, like a sheep without a shepherd. Yeah. Acts two twenty two. Men of Israel, hear these words: Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know. Yeah. So we see Jesus's method. First one, he taught. He preached, and he did signs, wonders, and miracles. He taught, he preached, signs, wonders, and miracles. And then we see that the Lord Jesus, that the the disciples continued the same thing after the Lord Jesus had gone. Right? He, they also taught, they preached, there were signs, wonders, and miracles. So, for us to minister in such a way, we must learn to maintain this balance. Of teaching, sharing, preaching, pre preaching meaning now. For example, you're sharing the gospel with somebody. You don't have to sit and preach. The law of Moses said this, and then you know the guilt offering was this, and so they'll say, "Okay, I don't want." Right? So we should be wise. We should know. Now, the setting where Jesus was was because people were following him. It was not like they had to go back home and cook. They were free. So Jesus used that, right? but what did Jesus do during the time when he met the Samaritan woman? He didn't say, "Come, I'll sit down. Let me explain to you." No, she, he knew. Next five minutes, she's going to go from here. So, so we use wisdom. But what did he do? He te he taught, he preached, and then there were signs, wonders, and miracles. And we can do that as well. We follow his example. We look at the book of Acts. The disciples did the same thing. The great apostle Paul did the same thing, right? So and then all of us can do the same thing, same method: preach, teach, science, wonders, and miracles. Now, many of them, many people ask, why science, wonders, and miracles are not happening in the church? And see, recently, somebody had sent an email: Why is it not happening in the church? Right? Why, why, why uh, people who are deaf cannot hear, people who are blind cannot see? Uh, why is it not happening? Now, that's a it's a good question, right? But we need to understand a few things. One is eventually it is not in our hands. 
God is the healer, right? But he is willing, right? Two, there are things that we must do. We must walk in faith also. We must believe. Whenever we go to North India, right, uh, really, it's very different. Because if we, every time we go, it's not like we are doing ministry there. We come back and we think, man, they are doing so much more than us. Right? Of course, there are different kinds of ministries, and God is using different churches, different ministries. But if you read about the miracles that are happening, not only not even here, there are miracles. There are things that God is doing. Right? He has done wonderful things. He's doing wonderful things. Recently, um, about two months back, uh, I was speaking to a friend of mine, and he was terminal. Right? He was terminal. He had uh, stage two cancer. Right? He was about 38, 39 years old. Stage two. Right? And so he went to church, uh, to another church. He went there and he was praying. He was asking God, you know, I have my whole life in front of me. I have my, uh, like a small you know, child here who will look after. My wife doesn't work, right? So he, was, he has been praying. And then recently he, he went to a, a prayer meeting within the church itself while praying. He felt that God healed him, right? So he came back. He, he didn't have any symptoms. So after two, three days, he went to the doctor's checked himself the doctor said there is no cancer right so there are things that are happening and this is just maybe one or two god is working but he wants to do more in the church he wants each one of us to step out in faith right uh, he wants us to spend time to be empowered and then go about doing what he wants us to do so the question is not why god is not doing the question is are we ready for a sacrifice? Are we ready to walk in this greater measure of faith? Are we ready to let go of certain things? Right? There were times I've prayed over people, prayed such a prayer, I thought they would be healed immediately. So it got worse. I'm saying, no, Pastor, still the same. What? <laughs> you know, that's very difficult, right? I pray for my back. Okay, praying, praying, praying. How do you feel now? It's paining more, Pastor, because I'm standing down. <laughs> okay, what will you do? Sit down. <laughs> it's not easy. And see, people don't nowadays people don't want to please. But they'll tell the fact. Right? That's a fact. It's paining. Now it doesn't mean that okay, because it's still paining, maybe I've not done something, or maybe he's not done something. See, you must understand that these things happen. Have you ever th thought about this in the pool of Silo? Jesus went there. So many people were there. So many people. Have you ever thought of it? Why did he go to this one person? He could have gone, no, okay, rise up, walk. Okay, rise up, walk. One by one, he would have gone everywhere, finished off. The whole pool of Silo would be empty. Right? It makes so much sense. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees would have said, hey, this guy is really something. But he healed one fellow and he walked out. Right? So God has his ways of dealing with situations, dealing with people. We trust his ways. But he is willing to bring healing. He's willing to bring deliverance. Right? So as ministers, we follow Jesus' example. Have faith. Do. Trust in God. Right? Preach, teach. Let there be signs, wonders, and miracles. If it's not yet started in your ministry, in your life, pray. Ask God. God, when I pray for people, you touch them. You heal them. Right? Let them experience your healing. Right? And you will notice, you know, when I started, probably about 22, 23 years old, all these people would come in. They would look at me. They would go off. <laughs> A small boy. <laughs> what do you pray? It's okay. That, that was the mindset, right? I was, I was very small, and I knew I was very small. But over time, the anointing will change things. People will recognize. People will come. Never think that we are too small or we are insignificant. Who will come to us? No. God will bring people. You pray. You spend time in God's presence. You will see the fruit in your ministry. And you will see signs, wonders, and miracles. 
let me give you this example. Uh, I've said this example also. Uh, in Mangalore, no? when we were in Mangalore, we were five or six people, eight people the first Sunday that I was there. I was so, I said, God, you have to do something here. I've come from Bangalore, so many things to do, you know, in ministry. Eight people, they come, half the sermon they were sleeping, half the sermon they were awake, and older people, oh, do you have to do something here? And so over time, just God, people started catching the vision, right? Became 15, 20, 25. So when I came to East, East, oh, I think we were, first Sunday, Ravavi, you remember? First Sunday, I think we were 50. 50 or 60, first Sunday, after the lockdown and all, many families went home. 60 people, I said, what is this? I said, we have to do something about this. Right? So we started doing you know, some kind of ministry, reaching out to people. And I remember saying, God, you give us a better space than this. This space I don't want. <laughs> I really prayed that. I'm being honest. right? I said, I don't want this place. Because uh, there was so much of difficulty, you know, the children's church and uh, something was not right. I, in my spirit, when I would go there, it's a very nice place, okay? It's a, it's a hotel. Uh, East. It was a nice, very nice place. But every time I go, I said, God, oh, I, uh, change this place. I don't want this place. So I would pray. I said, God, I don't want this place. Change this place. Change this place. Suddenly, we got to know AC is not working in the hotel. He said, you can't have service. So we bought fans. Oh. So we were using the fans. I said, no, I don't want this place. But we did. Give me a new place. Then we got a space right now that we are in. It's a huge hall. It seats about 300 people. Right? So that was a temporary move until this AC gets fixed. So the point was, we are going to go back once the AC gets I was saying, I don't want that. <laughs> AC. AC, even if you're fixed, we don't want to go back. You know, so much I prayed. I said, God, this hall is the best. This is what I envision. I can picture 300 odd people sitting in this church. I want this place. Those fellows that, uh, you know, the people that keys, uh, the hotel, uh, hotel people said, okay, it's ready. Please, you can come back. Because all our equipment, everything was there. Then I checked with the team and said, okay, just find out. They doubled the rent. I said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> So we're going to stay back here. Sent an email. Pastor said, "No going back there. You stay here." <laughs> Thank you, Lord. So now we, now we have a 300-seater auditorium with a stage, everything. I'm praying, God, you fill it up. He will fill it up. How he'll do it, I don't know, but he'll do it. What is our responsibility? Do our programs, do outreaches, pray, teach, minister. Let signs, wonders, and miracles happen. Will God fill it up? He will fill it up. Whether I'm there or no, I don't know. But he should fill it up. Right? When in Mangalore, we were 10 people, I would say, God, I, I would ask the people, how many people in this place can fit? They said, 80 people squeezed. I said, God, we have to move out of this place. Next week, they're moving out. 100 odd people in the church now. And so God is able to. I'm really saying God is able to, but it's only our how much we put in, how much we sow is what we can reap, right? So the methods were the same. Then Jesus went about traveling to places. He went preaching the gospel, motivation to go from place to place, cities, towns, villages, uh, and he was able to preach the gospel, right? Yes, go ahead. Hmm. Yes. Always we have to, I mean, yeah, we will go to the cross and mm. mention it at mm. some point, but it won't be like this traditional way yeah. that this is what it is. Yes, that's that's perfectly fine. So Ravali's question was: uh, there were time, there are times when we can, when sharing the gospel, we don't um, 
you know, we don't go through that traditional, okay, gee, we were all sinners and those what we learned in lifestyle evangelism. Uh, yeah, that's fine. It, we don't have to go through it. But the point is you're able to speak to them. You're able to like uh, let them know about what God can do in their life. Right? And, uh, and if you're meeting for the, like if you're doing street evangelism, you're standing, it's not easy that you may meet them again. Uh, but you can, that's where we need to depend on the Holy Spirit. God, give me a word for him. Give me a prophetic word. Even if I say two, three sentences, let it touch their lives. Right? So uh, God will put the words in your mouth, what to speak, how to speak. Right? So, but there's nothing wrong in, you know, talking to them. They may talk about work and you're sitting and listening. Ask God to give you opportunities. In between. So that's not wrong. Right? See, one thing is important is we must know the, we must understand the motivation. Right? Why are we doing this? If you know your motivation is, okay, I want people to know about Jesus, whatever you do is fine. Right? However you express it, it's fine. doesn't matter. Right? Then when Jesus uh, did his ministry, he also uh, saw a lot of challenges, just like what you and I see. Uh, unbelief, they were, you know, people were, people didn't believe in him, didn't believe his message. Right, uh, so there will be times when we go out. If people don't believe our message, nothing to cry. Go to the next person. Simple, right? Move on. Uh, there'll be demonic encounters. Jesus Himself saw demonic encounters. There were people who were possessed by demons, right? Who came and Jesus was able to encounter them, right? And then there was opposition from religious leaders. Right, so here in our society, there may not be opposition from religious leaders, but there will be opposition from people around us. And uh, of course, here is where we walk in wisdom. Uh, so people ask me, right? So if people sometimes they say, oh, if Jesus could do, if Jesus did everything. He he says, go reach out to people. What to do in places where there is, you know, uh, where there's persecution, where there is. You know, people, you know that you will get persecuted for sharing the gospel. So the answer is this. The Lord Jesus, when he was in Jerusalem, what did they do? They wanted to kill him. They, firstly, they didn't accept his message. Then they wanted to get rid of him. But he knew his time was not right. So what did he do? He went to Judea. Very simple. Right? He says, that's why when he's coming back from Judea, he looks over the city of Jerusalem and he weeps over it. Right? Because why does he weep? They were waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah is here. Their eyes are not able to see it. Right. So here, there will be oppositions. There will be times we may need to use wisdom. We may need to just step out, walk away. Jesus did that, so when we can do it. It's not a sign of fear. Right. It's not a sign of fear to say, okay, this is not a like. For example, we know there are certain areas in Bangalore which is dominated by other faiths. It's a strong area. right? We pray over them, but we need to be wise how we do ministry there. Right? We can't say, oh, God is all-powerful. We know that. The Lord Jesus himself said, let me step away. He went to Judea. When things settled down in Jerusalem, he came back. Wisdom. right? And finally, uh, he had support. He sent others to reproduce. Uh, and people gave into his ministry financially as well. How do we know that? Because we know that Thomas was keeping the accounts. Sorry, uh, Judas was keeping the accounts, right? So um, he had support. He he raised up leaders. He said, go minister to people. So we see that Jesus, he fulfilled all the criteria to be an evangelist as well. He set the example. He set the model for us so that we can also uh, you know, go ahead and be these evangelists. Now, if your calling is not an evangelist, see, one thing I know is my calling may not be evangelist, but I love to reach out to people. I love to go out. You know, every now and then I keep going to Whitefield where the church is. Let's go reach out, give tracks, try to reach out to people. It's okay. Right? We know. No, but, but if I have to go to a certain place where we know it's not safe, I need to be wise. Right? I need to think. So, we model ourselves, we model our ministry, our life, just like how Jesus did. All right? All right, so we finish this chapter. We'll meet next class for the next chapter, chapter 3. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, online students. God bless you. Have a good week ahead.